Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to Simon Fraser University and to uh, today's Carbon Talk. My name is Michael Small. I'm the Executive Director uh, of Renewable Cities and Carbon Talks here at the Center for Dialogue of Simon Fraser University. Uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, kick off a fall season of Carbon Talks. Uh, many of you are regulars, and you might have been wondering sort of, you know, where did Carbon Talks go? Because this has been a very active franchise. We had a a large event earlier in the year, which I know some of you attended in uh, March on the road to Paris. That was over at the Asia Pacific Hall across the street with the Ambassador of France to Canada, um, the Honorable Mary Pollock, BC's Minister of Environment, and Mayor Gregor Robertson. Um, but since that time, our team has been rather busy involved in launching renewable cities. So I'm really pleased that we're able to renew doing our public carbon talks. And our, this is the first one for the fall season. Our intention is to do them every month. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the ones that are coming up in October, November, when we've concluded today. Uh, today, it's a real pleasure to invite Jennifer Allen to, uh, to speak to us. And um, I asked Jennifer to come and give this talk because I think everybody in the room knows very well there's uh, a major next step in international climate change discussions and negotiations will be the Conference of the Parties, COP21 in Paris. Fewer people actually know what goes on at a COP, what actually happens as the sort of informal headline we gave behind closed doors or maybe not so closed doors or the real things behind closed doors. What is actually being negotiated? How does this thing work? A lot of people are going to be there uh, positioning themselves in various ways, but what's actually going on at the core of the negotiations? So that was the question I put to Jennifer. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about her and then uh, give her the floor to kind of lead us through what she's called a primer to climate change negotiations and to the COP process. Uh, I'll put a few more questions to Jennifer in a conversational way and then we'll open it up to everyone to have a dialogue, both questions to her, comments you want to make, comments you want to make on the comments, uh, and we'll take it from there. So Jennifer is, uh, uh, is a PhD candidate in political science at uh, UBC, and she's doing her doctorate on global environmental politics, particularly efforts to address, uh, address climate change, reduce chemical pollution and waste. Um, in particular, though, her expertise for this purpose comes from her, the role that she's played as a lead writer for the IISD, the International Institute for Sustainable Development, a Canadian-based organization, its reporting services, and in particular, the Earth Negotiations Bulletin. And she's a lead writer for the ENB. And I think towards the end of uh, today's session, I'll ask Jennifer to explain a little more about her experience, actually, the role that she plays at COPS as a writer for the ENB, which is a a unique institution. It certainly has given her direct exposure to the process and some uh, uh, kind of privileged insights. So, uh, and she has the benefit of knowing what negotiators do, even if she's not been a negotiator herself. So, uh, I could read up more of her bio, but I think that's on the web, and I know many of us would like to get going. I'll only say a couple of other administrative things. Uh, first of all, I'd very much like to thank our funders, the North Growth Foundation, which has been a constant funder for, uh, for the carbon talks process, uh, for the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, which specifically enables us to webcast all of these talks. So we're being live cast now. And if you know people who haven't been able to make it or you'd like to go back and look at parts of this, it'll be up on the Center for Dialogue website. And lastly, of course, the SFU Center for Dialogue, which provides our administrative home. If you'd like to tweet, our hashtag is uh, hashtag at COP21. If you'd like to send questions, you can send them to at Carbon Talks, capital C, capital Key, T, Carbon Talks. That's in particular for people who are maybe watching live but in other locations. And we'll take a few questions uh, that might come in during the session. Um, and really, that's it. So I'm now going to turn the microphone over to uh, Jennifer, who is going to give us an introduction as to what happens behind closed doors. Jennifer. Okay, I think I'm mic'd up. Can everyone hear me? Great. I'm just going to do a little dance between the computer and the screen. Uh, maybe this will work. OK. Uh, so this is, as Michael said, a primer slash crash course. Uh, I've been challenged with giving you the history of the climate negotiations process in about 10 minutes. So to start, there's 15 years on this screen. Uh, the top left is 1992, and this was the result of a decision in 1990 where all the countries of the world said, okay, we're going to do something about this whole climate change thing. Uh, although then it tended to be called global warming. So the negotiations were quite swift. 
between 1990 and 1992 in about 18 months. Countries got together and they managed to negotiate and finalize in Rio the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, generally UNFCCC or for the super lazy UNFCCC. So 1992 is one of these watersheds. The UNFCCC, the, the convention, it sets up a lot of rules, basic rules, that have turned into legacies that we're still working through in the negotiations. So there's a principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. Uh, this principle is enshrined in the UNFCCC. It's linked to this idea of equity that developed countries should take the lead. And it's still a hot topic in 2015, 25 years later. It also sets up annexes. Uh, this is a rough and dirty way of categorizing countries. So developed countries, very roughly speaking, uh, are Annex 1. Developing countries, again roughly speaking, are non-Annex 1. And at the time, this wasn't a big deal. Uh, yeah, we're just coming out of the Cold War. So we knew there's the North, we knew there's the South, we knew there's these post-communist countries in between, let's figure out what to do with them. But nobody really devote, doubted that these divisions exist. The next one up on the top right, I guess it is, if we're facing, you guys can figure it out, 1997. So in 1995, countries started saying, okay, well, let's negotiate a protocol to go with this framework convention, very much along the ozone model where we have the Vienna framework convention and then we have the Montreal protocol that lays out more specific rules. But already then, this division developed developing countries was starting to be questioned. And most specifically the US, but other, some other developed countries we're saying, you know, these emerging economies that are starting to kind of percolate up need to start doing something. And so differentiation, this who does what, has been an issue since, since that time. Now the Kyoto Protocol that they adopted in 1997 is what's called now a top-down agreement. Uh, it says X country will reduce by this much below 1990 levels by this year. And you know, it's not based on any sort of magical mathematical formula. It was a horse trading where countries came forward and said, I'll take zero, please. And everyone got together and said, actually, that, that's minus five. Uh, so it's not based on any rigorous way of doing differentiation among countries. It's based on a negotiation horse trade that happened. But it's top down. It's written in there, thou shalt do this. This all led to uh, Stéphane Dion in the bottom corner hugging Richard Kinley, the deputy of the UNFCCC Secretariat, uh, because 2005 was a really big meeting and it was in Montreal. This was the first meeting of the members, or sorry, the, what are they calling it now? The conference of the members that are parties to the convention, or to the protocol. So it's the first meeting after the protocol entered into force. This was a big deal because the US, first thing George W. Bush said is, I will not be ratifying this, thank you very much. And so in order to get 50% of emissions from developed countries, so enough developed countries that represent 50% of global emissions had to ratify this protocol for it to enter into force. So Canada needed to be on board. Russia needed to be on board. All of those countries got on board, it still managed to enter into force. So 2005 was the first meeting after the protocol entered into force. It also, because of the rules in the protocol, they had to start thinking about negotiating a new protocol. So there's a rule that says, you know, once there's uh, seven years before the Kyoto Protocol is set to expire, countries need to start thinking about what to do afterwards. And there is zero appetite to do this. You know, they had just managed to get this thing entered into force. So they started this convention dialogue, you know, round table. Countries sort of started exchanging ideas on what they could do, what might be possible new things if we had a new agreement. And in Bali here in 2007, they came up with the Bali Action Plan. This was the negotiation agenda for what would be in this post-Kyoto agreement. And they had two years to finish this. So by 2009, they had to be agreeing to this post-Kyoto agreement. Everybody with me so far? So uh, Copenhagen, unmitigated disaster on multiple, multiple fronts. Uh, sorry for the pun, unmitigated. Uh, so, hey. so civil society, 
a slight problem. This was the largest meeting that had ever happened in the climate talks, by far. So the Bella Center, where this all went down, was supposed to be able to hold 15,000 people. 25,000 at least showed up. At that time, so it's very different than, than now, and we can talk about that. At that time, they didn't have this ticketing or the ticketing system where you, know, you get this many badges, you get this many badges, where they're allocated well in advance of the meeting. So they just said, come on down. You know, they'd never had this problem before. So who do you decide to kick out first if there's not enough room in the meeting? It's not the state parties. So civil society was having a heck of a time getting in, and a lot of civil society was left out, which led to the first set of calls around transparency in this issue, or in this process. The second, uh, so what ended up happening? There was, before Copenhagen, around a 200-page negotiation text. Uh, all of it was in brackets. So what countries do when they can't agree on something is they keep the words and put square brackets around it, and that means nobody agrees to this. It's just, you know here. So 200 pages of completely bracketed text. Uh, that's what they showed up in Copenhagen with. And it wasn't going very well, and then the worst possible thing happened, heads of state decided they were going to negotiate. Generally not a good idea. So about 15 to 20 heads of state sat in a room. Very few people even knew this was happening. Uh, those that didn't know it was happening didn't know what was going on in that room. And Andr Angela Merkel, Barack Obama, I think it was the premier, not the president of China at the time, Indian prime minister, they sat and negotiated the Copenhagen Accord. So Venezuela, this is Claudia Salerno, uh, Tuvalu uh, put up their flags and said, this isn't a legitimate agreement. We were not even involved in these negotiations. Not to mention the fact that this is a two-page document. The second page is an empty Excel table that is like the basically default temple, template if you just open Word for how to make a table. Uh, so there was a lot of transparency issues around that. So the substance was missing. The process was missing. Copenhagen ended. And the best they could do after hours of debate was, we will take note of this accord. That's it. So it has very dubious legal standing at that point. The next year in 2010, Copenhagen took a lot of the things that they thought were kind of ripe for agreement in Copenhagen before everything went off the rails, and it kind of put the train back on track um, in Cancun, yeah. So that was uh, pledges around mobilizing $100 billion in financing per year by 2020. Uh, that was establishing the Green Climate Fund, that was agreeing to rules around deforestation in developing countries called RED, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. And then there's a lot of other words. Uh, what else? Setting up sort of a review system. Because what the Copenhagen Accord did is it shifted away from the model of the Kyoto Protocol. So the Kyoto Protocol, top down, you know, you will reduce by this much by this year. Copenhagen Accord, empty table. Sign up your name. Sign up what you want to do, just let us know. So countries come forward and say, here, this is our pledge to the Copenhagen Accord. And then this pledge, instead of a compliance mechanism like the Kyoto Protocol has, will be reviewed by your peers. That's the Copenhagen Accord, complete shift from top down to bottom up. And that's what we can expect more of in Paris. Because in 2011, Countries still had this issue of the Kyoto Protocol expiring in 2012, so they agreed to start new. So they failed in Copenhagen. They still had this body that kept meeting, but no one was really sure why. So they said, okay, the body that's been negotiating the, 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 what was supposed to replace the Kyoto Protocol, you're done. We're going to start a new one. So basically people moved to the next room over. And the big, there are two things in this. The first is applicable to all. So there's not as much differentiation. Everybody's supposed to be taking some form of an agreement or uh, they're supposed to be participating in this new agreement. Whether or not they will be, everyone will have a legally binding obligation is another question. But applicable to all means no one's doing voluntary, if you feel like it, contributions. China and India are on board now, which was necessary if the US was ever going to sign and ratify this. 
The second is this really vague nonsense at the beginning. To develop a protocol, another legal instrument, or an agreed outcome with legal force. So in order to get that applicable to all, there had to be a trade. So a lot of countries, the EU especially, wants legally binding. A legally binding protocol. Other countries obviously don't want that, especially if this will be their first time that they will be putting forward a target. And so there's these wishy-washy words. And frankly, they still don't know the answer to this. So you know, we have three weeks of negotiation time, and that's not sorted whatsoever. So Durban was a big deal. Durban kind of restored hope in the process. And then since then, we've had three years. So Warsaw, this idea of pledging. So you pledge to the Copenhagen Accord. This idea of pledging got a new name. Intended nationally determined <coughs> contributions. And I'm pretty sure it was that huddle about 17 hours or so after the meeting was supposed to end. Um, not my favorite thing that these guys do. Uh, that in this huddle, because they couldn't agree on this phrase, it was originally intended nationally determined commitments. And that was wording very much favored by the US, other developed countries, commitments, because they wanted emerging economies to take commitments. That wasn't going over very well. So in this huddle, India proposed contributions. And so INDCs became a new C. Is it a commitment? Contribution. And they managed to agree to that in, in this very transparent process where hopefully you're in the center of the huddle or else you have no idea what was just said. Um, and then everyone goes and sits down, pats themselves on the back, and someone reports who was in the middle, this is what we just agreed, is everybody okay with that? And they've all pulled three all-nighters by this point, so everyone's generally okay with that. I certainly usually am. Last year was Lima. So Lima did two big things. The, the conference elaborated the rules for these INDCs, so broad ideas of what should be in them. Uh, it also elaborated when these should come out. So countries are supposed to communicate their INDCs before Paris. And most countries have. So about 93% of these Annex 1, these developed countries, have communicated theirs. It's fully public information. If you're curious, the UNFCCC has their INDC portal. So you can look at what countries have submitted. Um, the spoiler alert, because this is the problem with the bottom-up process, right? So the UNFCCC takes around its collection plate and everybody puts in their, their two cents. Um, they're all different. So Canada and the US are about the same. Uh, 27, 28, I think Canada is 30% below 2005 levels by 2030. The EU, minus 40, below 1990 by 2025. China, we promised to peak our emissions by 2030. And so they're different baselines, different target years, different amounts of reductions. Peaking, we're not really sure what to do with generally. Um, how do you kind of make heads or sense, any sort of heads or tails of what's going to happen and what do these things add up to? And the spoiler alert at this point is that they don't add up to enough to keep us under two degrees. Um, so the conversation now is how do we review, revise, how do we anchor into the agreement something along the principle of no backsliding is something that AOSIS and least developed countries are really pushing for. You know, some sort of principled chalking the wheels so that we can progress forward. And so 2015, there's, uh, there was a series of negotiations in, there was a week in February where they adopted what they call the Geneva Negotiating Text. So it has 12 sections. Uh, that will be the 12 sections of the agreement unless they just magically all agree to get rid of a couple. Uh, they did what they call a compilation text. So each negotiating group basically said, here's our favorite thing for this section. And then they put brackets around all of it, so every country's favorite stuff is there. At least every coalition's favorite things are there. Um, and now they're trying to make sense of this. And what they're really struggling with is compromise, of course, right? Uh, it's what everyone struggles with. So how do you make a bridging proposal that says, I know you want this, I want this. If we do this in between, will that meet both of our needs? They're very much struggling with that. And so instead of coming up with it, they've asked the co-chairs 
to produce a text, which will look closer to what they're supposed to be adopting in Paris. Um, we'll see if they can pull it off. Some of these issues are very contentious and uh, entrenched. Um, common but differentiated responsibilities is now grown to be common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities in light of national circumstances. That's supposed to solve differentiation. Not really sure how that does. Um, there's also key issues that can sink Paris. So climate finance is one. There is little transparency on how much is currently being delivered. There are uh, several countries that suspect that their ODA has been re-tagged as climate finance, so it's not new and additional. Um, and no one knows how we're getting to 100 billion by 2020. Uh, so that's a big issue, and now it's been moved up to the ministerial level. So there's sort of this tripartite system happening to try to get success in Paris. So heads of state are meeting informally in New York this weekend to try and think about sort of the visionary side of things. They'll be meeting on the side of the Sustainable Development Goals Summit. Ministers met in June to talk about differentiation in finance. Finance ministers are continuing to meet throughout September and on the margins of a meeting in Lima uh, that I think the World Bank and the IMF are putting together, they're expected among the finance ministers to come up with what the climate finance package will be. So they've kind of taken it out of the technical negotiations in the UNFCCC and put it at the ministerial level. So hopefully that piece will be enough to kind of facilitate or grease the wheels of the rest of the text. Uh, then we have a negotiation session in October, I think it's third week in Bonn, and then we have Paris. So there are 16 days, and uh, there isn't really actually a negotiation text yet. Um, this might not be anything to worry about. I mean, the Kyoto Protocol text actually arrived in October and was adopted in December, although it was shorter and streamlined, and uh, the options, like the political options, were very clear. Uh, so there's cautious optimism at best, but there's certainly a lot of people thinking this is also potentially Copenhagen. Um, so on that happy note, uh, I think Michael has questions for me. Thank you very much. And thank you for that excellent. <laughs> um, Jennifer, I'll just put one question which follows on from what you've just said, and then I'll just mm -hmm. open it to the floor because I think many people want to pose things that will illuminate. And I'm getting a reminder to use the microphone. So um, if you can just build on a little bit more on what you said, what is it that you, you would, your best guess, given the stages that take place between now and Paris, that countries are going to be negotiating in Paris? Yeah. When uh, we've all been following our own election campaign, you hear political leaders saying, I want to be there in order to, quote, negotiate a deal in Paris. That's the sort of the conventional shorthand description certainly in the media, negotiating a deal. To me, that sounds like it's got resonances of what happened in Kyoto in 1997 and in other sorts of negotiations. But as you've described, the whole game has shifted significantly from top down to bottom up and important parts have been moved off for other in other streams on financing. So what is the negotiation going to actually revolve around in this place that will have somewhere north of 25,000 people uh, at it. Um, definitely, I think I'm still... You're right. Yeah? Okay. Uh, definitely north of 25,000. They're actually expecting 45, 47,000 people in Paris. Um, so leaders that are not at the negotiation table and don't already have that, that pink badge that gets you into the blue zone, it's very color gender oriented. <laughs> um, I mean, it, I, I heard, you know, there's several Canadian premiers going. They're not going to be negotiating anything in Paris uh, if they can get into that room. It's an interstate negotiation. Um, in terms of what will be negotiated there, uh, there's still a lot. So one area I didn't mention is called loss and damage. So it's sort of this evolving pillar. We have mitigation, reducing your emissions. We have adaptation, so rebuilding, building resilience to the effects of climate change. And loss and damage is what happens when both those efforts fail and your island is underwater or a community is wiped out by a typhoon. 
This is obviously a key issue for a lot of developing countries. Um, and, a, and it's an issue that is thorny because developed countries have some sensitivities around it. Um, they have, does this introduce the idea of tort law and compensation, for example? Uh, and so that's, that's one issue that has to be negotiated, that they have to find some way to deal with it. There, are in, there is an institution, there's the Warsaw Mechanism on Loss and Damage and in very UNFCCC speak. Um, but whether or not that's enough to meet the needs that some developing countries identify is something that has to be negotiated. Uh, there's these 12 sections of the text. And unlike Kyoto, where it was focused on industrialized countries reducing their emissions, these 12 sections span the gambit. So it's adaptation, loss, and damage. It's mitigation. It's mitigation from multiple sectors, including forests in developing countries and developed countries. It's technology transfer. It's finance. It's a uh, compliance mechanism. So some of these things, even though we have 20 years of climate policies that exist, they need to decide which policies they're going to keep because some of these things like the clean development mechanism exist under the Kyoto Protocol. When the Kyoto Protocol expires in 2020, that could go away, essentially. So they need to decide what do we keep? What serves this new agreement? And do we strengthen them? Do we build something new? And all of this sorting and and trying to build some new policies where they need new policies still needs to be negotiated. And so it's, a, it's an incredible amount of work that's still left. I'll take the opportunity to ask one more question. Can you talk a bit about the staging? Because you've already referred to the Kyoto Protocol, which is, for lack of a better word, please improve it, being phased out or certainly not being renewed. It technically expires in 2020. Mm -hmm. Um, but the staging between 2015, 2020, and beyond, and how that's going to shape uh, what countries will be debating, discussing, negotiating in Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, so this new agreement takes effect in 2020. So we're supposed to agree to it in December. It takes effect in 2020. Uh, slight problem, what do you do in between those things? Uh, so there's what's called the emissions gap. So we know right now that what countries are doing is insufficient to keep us on any sort of trajectory to keep us under two degrees. But these pledges, these INDCs, don't even come into effect until 2020. So there's, a, there's an area of the negotiations now, again, very jargon, silly phrasing, it's work stream two, which tells you nothing about what it does. Uh, so work stream two is focused on 2015 to 2020, how do we ramp up ambition? And that's an area that's actually quite innovative in a lot of ways. They're opening up to sectors that are usually not involved. They're opening up to actors that are usually not involved. So there's a lot of work there on work engaging with subnational actors, cities, uh, transportation, uh, engaging the forest sector in ways that hasn't necessarily happened in the more rigid UN system. They're engaging the private sector quite a bit. So they're trying to pull any lever they can that is that holds potential for mitigation. Um, so that's that's part of it. And then the other part between 2015 and 2020, um, and this is sort of my sense of what we'll end up with in Paris, is that there's such a strong desire to not repeat Copenhagen that they'll come up with something. Um, my sense is it'll be short, it will be very high level, and it will identify significant areas of future work to be completed before this thing comes into effect. And so I think really in some ways Paris is the start of the negotiations more than the end. Um, and so between 2015, 2020, I think a lot of these things that they just don't have time to do, they'll say, this is a work program and we will agree to this by 2019. They'll give themselves a date. Um, I mean, that's my sense of what's going to happen, that there will be sort of the operational rule book for this new agreement will be negotiated between 2015 and 2020. Much like the Kyoto Protocol had this uh, round of negotiations after the protocol was adopted called the Marrakesh Accords, where the operational rule book was really written. Great. Well, thanks very much. And I'll now open this up to questions and comments from the floor. Maybe we'll start with Paul Meyer. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. That was a pretty amazing uh, effort to uh, give the uh, history of the uh, negotiations. Uh, 
Thank you. Um, and uh, I want to just pick up, but there's so many uh, elements of this one could explore, but uh, you, you sort of uh, offhandedly said, well, the premiers here uh, may show up, but uh, they won't have any role in the negotiation. And uh, yes, of course, technically it's the federal government that uh, represents Canada, but um, it would be quite open for a federal government to invite uh, premiers to be part of uh, the federal government uh, delegation. And, given uh, the significance of uh, the provinces and any implementation of a nationally agreed plan, I mean, that's uh, sort of common sense. You might almost say no-brainer. Uh, but I invite you to um, uh, speculate, given as well that we will have a federal election between now and Paris, as to whether one might see a, a different approach to managing the Canadian delegation. And, uh, also aligned with that, uh, welcome any um, views you might have about civil society's uh, role in, in Paris and how uh, effectively sort of organized will, will it be as a, another voice uh, to move uh, states in the right direction. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I haven't ever seen uh, subnational leaders on the Canadian delegation. Um, that doesn't mean to say it doesn't happen. As you say, like, I, I know that in certain trade negotiations that provincial leaders are invited to liaise with uh, the delegation on a regular basis or they're formally put on the dele delegation. Um, I haven't heard that that's going to happen. And I think because there is this thing called the election happening that that might be up in the air. Uh, one change recently uh, under our current government is that opposition leaders or members of other parties used to be on the delegation and now are not. So Elizabeth May, because she's a lawyer, uh, has represented several countries in the last few years. I think in Warsaw she was representing Afghanistan uh, because as an environmental lawyer she's a skilled negotiator and that gets her in the room and she can help. Um, and, and countries like Afghanistan need environmental lawyers. It's not really, they don't have a large capacity for that right now. Uh, they're busy. So it's, I think it is certainly a possibility and I think it would be a welcome sign and I think it would be something that uh, could improve an implementation of whatever agreement we come up with. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of opportunity to uh, change these, this INDC. So we have an election very soon, well, no, not very soon, just feels like it. Uh, I think we're still a month out or three weeks out. Uh, then we're supposed, so this, our INDC is in, our promise is in. Unless the new government, if we have a change in government, has a very clear idea of exactly what emissions reductions they can expect to achieve with their quite vague policy promises right now, they don't have the ability to change that promise before Paris. So the question is, what do they do? And the rules about how you can change these INDCs are completely up in the air. And so that might be one area of a new government to work on is you know, building a way for us to, to change them. Um, and I think engaging with subnational actors directly on the delegation would be a way to do that. But I haven't seen that with the Canadian delegation. Um, doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It just means I haven't seen it personally. Uh, in terms of civil society, it's tricky. So civil society um, has fragmented in about the last eight years or so. Um, there's the Climate Action Network, which probably several people have heard of. There's also Climate Justice Now. There's uh, a significant progressive labor movement. So they're all pushing for a deal. They all just have very different ideas of what that deal should be and what it should include. Uh, so they tend to be quite good in Copenhagen, despite quite acrimonious relations amongst some of these civil society groups. They all came together for a huge march. I know there's another one planned. Um, hopefully they're all working together. Uh, but I do know that there are some plans among some groups to have you know, marches going all the time and a loud civil society voice at least trying to pressure from the outside the negotiations. Just a quick comment. I know that in uh, Lima of last year there were at least five ministers of environment, provincial ministers, who were mm. there and had some relationship with the Canadian delegation, but no, they have, of course, no direct role in the negotiations because it's whoever's speaking for Canada, in this case, Minister Gluthak. Uh, post the election, we'll see who's doing that role, but it's, uh, I mean, from what I've heard, uh, it's a near certainty that uh, Premier Clark, quite possibly Premier Notley, 
certainly Premier Wynn, absolutely Premier Curiard, to name those ones, and maybe one or two more Canadian Premiers will be going, plan to go, and you've heard several of the candidates um, uh, in the current election announcing that they plan to be there, whatever role they're playing in the Canadian Parliament after the election. So it'll be um, a multi-ring circus just within the Canadian delegation, and we're only one of 192 countries. So um, I'll pass to uh, you, and if somebody could just uh, give you the mic, and we'll carry on. Yeah, quick question about the underlying accounting. Uh, back since the 80s, there was, there's always been discussion about production versus consumption-based accounting. Huge impact. We take a look at our carbon budgets in North America, and they're probably three times if we went to a consumption-based accounting system. Is that going to come up at all? Is that still an elephant in the room that could be a problem? Uh, it's, I mean, it's a huge problem for the developed world because we are offshoring all of our carbon, mm -hmm. <laughs> and yet we consume <laughs> all the products that come out of China and wherever else. And excuse me, if you wouldn't mind, uh, uh, oh. sorry, I should have asked people just to introduce yourselves, okay. and if you would like to give an affiliation, do so. Uh, Randy Chatterjee, um, one affiliation in the Pacific Institute for Ecological Economics, right. which I founded. Um, I guess the, the quick answer is they're nowhere near that level of detail. Um, but I think <laughs> it, it absolutely matters. I mean, of course, China uh, has a rapidly growing export-oriented economy where, thank you, you're now producing probably everything I'm wearing and all the emissions associated with that, and I'll just buy that back. Um, so yes, production versus consumption-based absolutely matters, and I don't see them moving from production-based yeah, yeah, okay. at any time. It's, sort of, it's one of those norms that now they just say, thank you, we're dealing with it this way. Thank you. Sven Anderson, GHG Accounting. Um, I'm involved in another process that is working towards COP, and that's on the local government level. And I just wanted to address that a little bit because I feel that there is a lot of things happening. There is frustration, of course, um, on the local government level that nothing has happened the same as we share the frustration. And in the past, they have used the COP event to make their own agreement just to show we can do it better than you do. Like C40 is one example, I'm sure you're aware of. But the, um, the realization has been in the last two years, at least in my perception, is that local governments are bearing the brunt. They're on the front. They have to make these changes. Uh, they have to deal with the citizens that are involved in these changes. And um, there is a movement from some um, government <coughs> levels that are supporting a process preparing for COPs since last um, autumn with different events, um, with one conference happening next uh, month in, in Germany to support local governments and have a much stronger voice, not to form another C40, but actually to influence the, the government um, communications. Can you comment on this? Like, do you feel it's a futile effort or they're not going to be listened to, they're not going to be let in the room? Or what's your view on this stream preparing for Paris? Mm -hmm. uh, local governments, uh, so the, they are one of these blessed few <coughs> that have what's called constituency status which means they get to speak to plenary, they get help organizing, they get invitations to technical workshops, and that really matters. It sounds like little trivial things, um, but there's only, oh gosh, seven or nine constituencies, and delegates know we listen to these groups. Um, the negotiations, I'd say, are cl more closed than they used to be. I'd say in the early days, there was certainly a lot more openness to talking to and listening to observers. Uh, I often now see uh, you know, all the cell phones come out when the observers start to give their interventions. Um, but cities is one of those areas where not only do they have this constituency side, which really provides this, this visibility in the negotiations, but cities are one of these kind of now hot topics, hot areas where the countries and the delegations are realizing this is an area where we can achieve some real mitigation gains. We can really achieve some reductions. And there's already on the ground movement happening. So how do we try to, to harness that? And so cities have been brought into the negotiations around this work stream too, especially more than before. And there are explicit references already to the role of cities and subnational actors in the draft text of the agreement. And so I think cities have a unique voice amongst observers, because they're still technically an observer. Um, so I think cities are one of those groups that will be listened to more than others. Uh, the trick will just be being heard above the cacophony of 
47,000 people all trying to be noticed. Um, it's going to be really tough in Paris. Uh, I think maybe anything that they can do in advance to talk to their national delegation before anyone arrives in Paris might be more useful. Hello, Deb Harford, Climate Solutions Fellow with the Centre for Dialogue and Executive Director of the Adaptation to Climate Change team at SFU. I kind of have an interlinked comment question. Um, there is some disagreement as to whether two degrees is a good goal. Um, some people say it's too high already. Uh, I know when I'm trying to keep myself to a limit and I'm likely to go over, I'll go over whatever the max allowable is. So it might have been better to set it at one and we'd end up at two. But uh, I don't know if there's any comment on whether that goal will be revisited, but I'm guessing not. So um, it, given that, is there any accountability going to be built in? What kind of teeth could this agreement have for if a country makes a commitment? Is there some way that they can be held accountable for that? Uh, that's a great question because, so the, deal with the first interlinked parts. Uh, there, will, there will be some review of this 1.5 or 2 degree goal because there was a, this was demanded by AOSIS in Cancun, I believe, to have this. Oh, Alliance of Small Island States, thank you. Uh, anytime I use an acronym, just, you know, raise your hand and tell me to spell it out. Um, so the Alliance of Small Island States demanded in Cancun that it's all lovely, you're going to agree to two degrees, we want a review of this global goal. And so that happened between 2013 to now. Uh, and some of the information in that review includes that it's too high, that at two degrees some islands will disappear, uh, inhabited islands that are states. Um, and so Again, this, there is a strong call by some countries for 1.5. Whether or not there's an appetite to actually adopt that as a goal, I'm not sure. And it's very unclear how this review will feed into the negotiations, given that it's supposed to end in December 2015, you know, days before the agreement. I mean, the timing really just doesn't work out there. Um, you know, benefit of hindsight when they agreed to this timing before they knew they were negotiating a new agreement. Um, so th there will be a conversation about it. I don't know if there will be movement on it. I kind of doubt that. Um, in terms of teeth, uh, this is one of the things that, that I find interesting about international relations generally. So technically, there's very little you can do. It's like getting kids in a sandbox and they can come up with their own rules about how to play together. Um, no sovereign country is really going to agree to stiff penalties should they break a rule, uh, just in case they're the ones that might actually end up breaking it. Um, and so the Kyoto Protocol has actually what's considered quite a robust compliance mechanism. Whether or not it's used is a totally different thing. So the Kyoto Protocol has a facilitative branch, so, so oh, you're in non-compliance, what can we do to help you? And they have a enforcement branch. Uh, oh, you're in non-compliance, what can we do to penalize you? Uh, they haven't penalized anyone. Um, some countries have actually complied, so the EU bubble has complied with, and they've met and surpassed some of their Kyoto targets. Other countries, no, sorry, one other country has just pulled out of Kyoto so that we didn't have to be held to account. Um, I don't know which one that is. Uh, and other countries such as Japan uh, and a few others have not met their their targets. Um, under the new agreement, they're maybe designing a new compliance mechanism. And so I don't see it being stronger than Kyoto. Uh, I see it probably being a bit weaker. And I see the differentiation conversation entering into compliance. So maybe the facilitative branch will be for developing countries and the enforcement branch for developed countries. Perhaps unsurprisingly, developed countries are saying, actually, we just want all facilitative branch for everybody. Let's all have the same thing and let's pick the weaker one. Um, so it's an, open, it's an open question. I know the Basel Convention has only facilitative and actually works quite well. Um, sorry, the Basel Convention is for the transboundary movement of hazardous wastes. So sometimes these things work, uh, but it's all in brackets and long and they have no idea what they're doing yet. Uh, Jennifer, how have you seen, or how have developing countries 
modified or not modified, evolved in the, their negotiating approaches, shall we say, from Copenhagen till, till now? Has there been some shifts in what they're looking for and the way they approach the negotiations? And if you want to break that down into you know, more than one basket of developing countries, because you alluded to coalitions, I, I'd be interested in, maybe you could elaborate that. Sure. Um, what you used to see is the G77 in China. So the group of 77 in China, a uh, large block of developing countries that, that works across a number of UN fora to be the voice of developing countries. And starting Copenhagen, that's been breaking apart into smaller groups. So in Copenhagen, you saw basic. Uh, so Brazil, South Africa, India, and China uh, as a negotiation coalition starting to work. Now there's also, uh, it's called ILAC, uh, so the Independent Association of Latin American States. And then when you translate that into Spanish and then take the, it's ILAC somehow. <laughs> Um, and so that is a group of, I think, seven or eight now Latin American countries that are trying to be a middle road compromise coalition to help bring everyone together. Uh, you see the least developed countries. They've been around since the beginning, but they're quite well organized now and speaking with one voice. Uh, now there's also the like-minded developing countries, which sort of an amorphous group, and we're not really sure what keeps them together, but it's a group of developing countries that are either emerging economies, so India and China are part of this group, but also developing countries with oil. So you'll see Venezuela, uh, Algeria, Saudi Arabia is also in this group of countries. So they obviously will have very different interests than the Association of Small Island Developing States, for example, uh, the SEOSIS group. And so you've seen the developing country voice you know, they'll still make a G77 statement at the beginning, and then you don't really hear from G77 as a whole because it's fractured into all these different coalitions that have overlapping membership. So China is in at least three of these. Um, and so it's making things quite difficult because developing countries don't want to work together. These are, I mean, there'll be six meetings happening at any given point someday, sometimes. So if you're a delegation with five people, you're not going to something, and your country has no representation in a meeting. Uh, so working together has huge benefits for developing countries with smaller delegations. Choosing your partners in that coalition is quite difficult. I'm pretty loud. But, uh, yeah. I think we did that. Counsel Thanks. for the recording. Thank you. Um, Jen, I'm Bill McIntosh. Um, and I guess I'd really be interested in a, a, a kind of a, a political assessment um, from you about the scale of, of global interest in the COP process and whether that's productive or, or not. And I suppose I'm just, I'm thinking about all of the institutions and players that are using the COP process and particularly Paris to advance other agendas. So the Secretary General has really raised the temperature, I think, with the sustainable development goals, the, the paper he's issued and calling on global leaders to do something really meaningful at Paris if we're going to do anything meaningful about the sustainability goals. And Rachel Notley, actually, Michael, she is committing uh, to be in Paris. She's saying that their, um, their climate, this is Andrew Leach's climate strategy review process will lead to recommendations that they will, they will make really the centerpiece of Alberta's position as which has got to be, it has to be somehow a critical part of whatever government gets elected. Alberta are saying our process, developing our next generation of a climate strategy, we will take to Paris. Um, so does that help or does it hurt when the Secretary General and, and keep subnational players like Notley do what they do now to, to really connect what they're doing to the COP process and to, to Paris? Does it make it more or, or less effective? Um, when I come up with that, it was probably when I'm writing the last bit of my dissertation. Because uh, it's not just subnational actors. So the anti-tobacco movement is showing up in Paris. Um, you know, the, the sustainable population, reproductive health folks have been going for a while. Uh, the, the number of people, the number of groups linking their issue to climate change is just exponentially growing. Um, the UN Secretary uh, General has no choice because, so one of these weird historical facts, 1990, 
the General Assembly says, no, no, climate change is not like other environmental issues. It's not going to the UN Environment Program. It sits under the General Assembly. So he has no choice but to be involved. Um, and he's not turning up the heat as much as he was before Copenhagen. And managing expectations into Paris has been a full-time job for the Secretariat. The, one of the main communications folks from the UN Environment Program, that has been his full-time job for two years now. Because people were going to Copenhagen calling it Hopenhagen. Uh, that didn't turn out well. Um, and so certainly managing those expectations leading into Paris has been very important. Um, at this stage, you can't stop the, the train. Uh, everybody, you know, this is the biggest game in town and people want to show up. And in some ways, it's become a bit of a proxy for sustainable development. It's a bit of a shame that these sustainable development goals, I mean, this is actually a big deal. It sets the development agenda for the next, for, well, for the foreseeable future has received a fraction of the press as this climate change thing that we're supposed to be doing in a couple months. Um, and so things have become, it seems like they've come a bit backwards, you know, it should be the other way around. Um, does it help? You know, I'm actually, so technical negotiations, it doesn't. I mean, no one wants a circus. Uh, no, no country wants to be sitting there with 47,000 people pointing at them saying, thanks, you're the reason this just failed. Um, but because now we're in this new bottom-up, I promise to do the following world, I actually think it might help. Because it means that there are segments of society that otherwise would never have been involved that go home to their country and said, you promised this. I know like, inter influencing internationally, that's not going to happen because it's not bottom down. I'm going to make sure that you follow up on that promise and that you make it better. And so I think splitting all of this up into all these different segments of society now saying we all do climate change. I mean, veterans associations are saying they do climate change now. Uh, it actually helps get more society on board to help build for national action because that's where the game is now. And so I actually think, you know, perversely, this might be a good thing. Interesting. We're coming close to the end of time. Ken, there's a question, I think, that's coming online. Yes, just a question from Twitter here from Adjavaria8, and the question is, what is the, roles of, what is the role of cities to influence international negotiations? Hmm. Um, I won't say, like, writ large international negotiations, because it'll be very different if, say, you're looking at pesticides or e-waste or something like this. But in the context of climate, uh, cities are observers to the process. Uh, they're observers that people tend to listen to a little more than other types of observers right now because they can, they really have the authority to do things. Um, and what will be interesting moving forward is if that recognition of cities comes along with some recognition of how can we help cities do this in terms of capacity building, maybe financial support, things like that. Because I think that will really actually unlock the potential. Um, I think, well, we've got just a tiny bit more time. Paul, would you like one more question? Yeah, so, Jane, I wonder if you might uh, elaborate on, on a problem that you referred to in your presentation, and which I always thought was uh, you know, suggestive to the outside world about the silliness of the process, and that is the failure up to now to agree on what the character of the product from the result from this meeting you have protocol, you have a, a legal instrument, and you have agreed outcome with legal force. Um, now, the simplistic might say all three of those suggest legally binding commitments. And isn't that you know, the crucial um, uh, nature of the debate? Because it has normally between political arrangements that are non-legally binding and legally binding ones. Uh, and I just wondered if you had any insight into why you had the, what seems to be a kind of non um, uh, sort of dispute still being one. Mm -hmm. um, so this is where I'll admit I'm not an international lawyer and I spend quite a bit of time with them so I pretend sometimes I know what these things mean. Um, it matters whether or not say it's a protocol because that means something internationally. Uh, you know, in, in the, the hierarchy of types of agreements, protocol is up there, something that's very legally binding. All countries know what that is. They sign onto a protocol and ratify it. And 
Um, so, but there's a range of gray about whether or not, say, they just do a series of decisions that are under the conference of the parties to the UN Framework Convention, is that legally binding enough? No one would have to ratify it, which might be good for the US right now, frankly. Um, but is that <coughs> legally binding enough? And so there's this sort of gradients of what is legally binding and how legally binding it is, and whether or not countries go back and ratify it is a very high test for legally binding. So I'm told, again, not an international lawyer. Um, and so some countries, this, uh, the ILAC coalition, the EU, are pushing for a legally binding protocol. And other countries, the US, um, are open to other suggestions. Um, because getting anything through Congress and to ratify in the US is an extra high bar is uh, something very difficult for them right now. They're actually open to the possibility of ratifying through an executive order. Uh, which they recently did for the Minamata Convention on Mercury. So if the U.S. can show that the rules under the Paris Agreement are similar to what is already in place in U.S. law, then President Obama might be able to ratify by an executive order without going to Congress. Um, that could be huge. But it makes for some tricky playing in how you design this agreement. Thank you very much. There's uh, a lot more we could ask about, and I noticed there was one more question. Um, Jen, if you could stay afterwards and just speak to people if they want to follow up with more questions. Perhaps before we conclude, um, you can just explain a little bit more about the Earth Negotiations Bulletin and where people can go if they're looking for information to follow what's happening leading up to Paris and at Paris. Um, since um, uh, obviously not everyone's going to be there, but everyone in this room, I think we can take it as a given, is interested in knowing uh, how it's shaping up and what will occur. Sure. Um, so the Earth Negotiations Bulletin, uh, its reason for being is transparency. And that goes two ways. First is transparency to the outside world. So I will fully admit that it is jargon heavy. There are acronyms. We apologize in advance. Um, but we generally also spell out what those acronyms mean. So it's a little bit better. Um, but the second way that we provide transparency is because developing countries, as I mentioned, are stretched thin in these, pro in these processes. If there's a forest negotiation and an agriculture negotiation, and you're supposed to be in both of those rooms because you're the only land person on your delegation, you pick. And then you read what happened in the other room in our bulletin the next day. It's the best that, you know, that can happen. And we're the, only, we're, we're the only one that provides a neutral, objective account of what happens. We name who says what, and everything is public. Um, there are other accounts. You can go to Third World, uh, the Third World Network and Climate Action Network, and they'll provide their views of what happened as, long as, as, as well as policy prescriptions. But ENB is focused on who said what, and we're known as sort of the informal record of what happens. Uh, we're known for our accuracy above all else. So we will provide daily bulletins of what's going on. We will maintain a website of what's happening every day. Uh, we're going to have video teams there providing videos of side events. So if you are really interested in a side event that someone's doing, we're videoing several of them. Uh, with, and instead of a webcast, it's sort of interviews of what people said in a sort of a punchy five-minute clip. Uh, we're also providing coverage and writing of a bunch of side events and photos. And we're there when they're there. So when they start negotiating all night, we break into teams and sit there with them in the room. Uh, we also have access to rooms that civil society doesn't. So we're in, uh, we're in the contact groups, which civil society can attend. We're in the informal negotiations, which civil society cannot attend. And uh, usually our contact list is good enough that we hear what happens in informal informals. And climate's the only process that has those. Informal informals where I don't know what the rules are, but they're more informal. So <laughs> I guess we're not allowed in them. Maybe that's the reason why they're there. Uh, yeah, the IISD who publishes the Earth Negotiations Bulletin. We also maintain a listserv of all things climate, uh, as well as forest, chemicals, biodiversity, oceans. Um, so if you're ever interested in, and you can always post to those. Uh, and we recently finished a set of four videos called the Paris Knowledge Bridge videos. That is your 
very quick and dirty primer to the climate process, including IPCC and economic issues, history, road to Paris, uh, what are we talking about when we say mitigation, adaptation, loss and damage, uh, means of implementation, and the interesting thing about those is we did them through interviewing 60 people in the process and asking them to explain what it is, which usually meant I'd say, can you please do that again and pretend I'm your mother? Because what you just said made no sense. <laughs> um, and so they're very accessible. And uh, they're a great way for anyone who wants to know what's going on, who is teaching, or might be showing up for their first time in Paris wondering what the heck is happening here. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's generally what we do. So we're a good source to keep in touch and, and keep updated with what's happening. Thanks very much. And I think what we'll do uh, is, uh, as Carbon Talks, we'll simply send out to everybody um, those links, yeah. uh, both to the videos. I've watched uh, part of one of them this morning. They're excellent. Uh, to the EMB site. Um, I think we'll also, if, you, if you're okay with it, send out also your presentation because uh, it's got some great visuals. So just to conclude, thank you very much for coming. Uh, let me do a quick uh, promo for our next Carbon Talk, which is in fact going to be next week in this very room uh, on October the 1st. That'll be delivered by uh, Dr. Martin Parkinson. He was the first secretary of the Department of Climate Change and Energy Efficiency in Australia. Went on to be the Secretary of the Department of Treasury, and he's going to talk about the inside the climate wars and the climate pricing wars in that particular country, which is, of course, uh, maybe geographically distant, but in lots of ways politically very similar to Canada. Uh, and uh, he knows the inside of what it's like to design a large carbon tax, try and get it implemented, and then the political fallout that happens from that. So, for people who are interested in uh, in the issues of carbon pricing and a story that's certainly not yet over in that country, but also might want to draw some parallels or some lessons for current debates, not just in this province, but in Canada. I strongly urge you to come because you won't very often get a chance to talk to somebody who's a very senior uh, government economist who's been at the coalface of designing those kinds of systems. Uh, that's uh, next Thursday here in this room. That'll be our October talk. Then in early November, uh, Deb Harford, who's here, and a colleague will be giving a talk on uh, climate resilience and adaptation. And uh, we'll, of course, notify everybody. I think what we should do uh, is do one in January on what happened in Paris. Um, a number of us will be here. I'm going to be in one of those 47,000 sort of swirling in some outer perimeter. You're going to be at least in the informals, if not the informal informals. Um, and after the press you know, news stories are over, uh, we might invite uh, four or five people from Vancouver, which is going to be well represented. Uh, it would be great if we could have the mayor, but uh, we'll, we'll bridge to that. Anyhow, kind of give a debrief on, you know, what part of the forest, what was going on where we were. And uh, I think that might be a fun thing to do in the new year. So uh, thank you very much for everyone's interest. Uh, please come on up and talk to Jennifer. If you've got more questions and comments, uh, speak to myself or my colleagues if you've got ideas for other carbon talks. And uh, have a very good afternoon.